the fall of 2001 on my way to teach here for the very first time. I took a short trip before I got here to the country of France. In 1983, after I had graduated from college, uh, two college friends of mine and I did a missions trip to France for the summer and we served at a camp up in the French Alps, the Pyrenees. It is absolutely spectacular. I don't know if you've been to mountains before, but the French Alps are different than the mountains even we have in America. They're rugged and they rise straight up hundreds of feet and the crevices go down hundreds of feet and snow on the top, just absolutely gorgeous. Well, on my way here, I took three days and went to France to see some of my friends who served at the camp. And while I was there, they said, why don't you take some time to just rest or go for a walk? And so I did. I love to go for walks. I love to run or I like to walk or ride bicycle. And I wanted to just go exploring up the mountain. And if you're ever in the French Alps, and it's probably the same in any mountains, there are old paths that weave their way up the mountains. Some of the paths in the French Alps, they tell me, go all the way back to Roman times, which blows my mind that they could be that old, some of the, the stone passages and things. So I started out on this morning walk, and I started out from the camp and worked my way up and followed a path, and it goes this way for a while, and it goes this way, and it works its way up, and you know, up after walking for 30 or 40 minutes, there was even a little town or a village way up on, the, on this mountain, but still there was hundreds of feet more to the top. I was never going to make it to the top. I just had a couple of hours to walk. And I came to, and I got back on the path and I kept going. And I noticed something as I walked past this one spot, there was a little sign in French. And I didn't know what it said because I don't know French, but I noticed something that as my path went this way, there was another path that came down and converged with it at that point. And I said, ah, I have to remember when I come back down to make sure that I go to the right and not to the left because I don't know where that path will take me. So I continued with my walk and I went up another hour or 30 minutes or whatever it was. Spectacular view. In fact, I was high enough to be above some of the clouds and could look across this enormous uh, valley and saw homes on the other side. I took pictures, fantastic. So I'm excited and I'm, I'm ready to work my way back down. And so I'm working my way down the path and I come to the little town and I pass through the town and I'm walking and all of a sudden I have this internal sense that said, I think you missed the, the, the point of turn. And I turned and I walked back and it wasn't more than about 10 meters or 20 meters and I saw the place where the paths had come together and the little French sign. And sure enough, instead of going to the right, I had gone to the left. But there was something inside that had told me that. So I went back, I corrected my way and I went all the way back down. As I think about that illustration, I think that oftentimes that's what we face in life. We're kind of working our way through life and navigating through this path and up this particular problem and this particular success and we come back this way and I say, I have to remember to stay on the right path. And sometimes, and it happens to all of us to varying degrees, we're walking along and all of a sudden there's an internal sense in us and for believers I would say that's the Holy Spirit saying, warning, 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 you've missed the path. And sometimes people don't listen to those voices, and I don't mean literal voices, but I mean that sense inside that says, am I missing something here? Am I getting off of the path? But those of us who are responsive to the Holy Spirit and understand the Word of God say, I need to stop, I need to turn around, I need to go back where I came from to get on the right path. I say all of that because there are, are voices that are coming against us today that want to get us off into the, onto the wrong track or the wrong path. There are voices of pleasure that say, this is fun, try me, there's no problem with this, there's no consequences, and something inside says, I bet there are consequences. There are voices even of friendships that say, oh, if we could only be a friend with her, if I could only be a friend with him, then I would be happy. And you get into that relationship and you say, something isn't right. 
There are voices of pressures of finance or pressures of family or expectations. Maybe you have expectations if you're a woman these days of how you should look and that voice that says, if I would only look like her, then I would be happy. And if you're a Christian, that voice of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is saying, that's not the voices you should be listening to. We've been talking about Paul writing to Timothy in the churches of Ephesus and all of the pressures and all of the voices that were shouting at the people in these churches, trying to get them distracted, the voice of, of teachers that were teaching incorrect theology and incorrect doctrine. There were voices that were saying, I want this role in the church, I want this role in the church, and there was arguing and bickering. And Timothy, as this timid, shy teacher, is saying, Paul, I don't know what to do, I can't do this. And Paul saying, Timothy, you can, you must. You must be the voice for God in His church that these people will follow and that these people will listen to. And if I could boil it down to one phrase, I would say it this way. How Christ-like I become depends on the voices that I listen to. How Christ-like I become depends on the voices, the influences, the supporting or distracting voices that I do or don't listen to. When we come back to the letter of 1 Timothy today, we enter chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And I'd invite you to take your Bibles there with me now. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. How do I hear what God is saying in a culture that is not Christian? And what Paul is about to show you here has incredible relevance for those of us who live now in the 21st century and all of the pressures coming at us, the, the, the visual pleasures and the distractions and the lusts and the temptations, the things that we hear, the things that we have a chance to participate in, some which are godly, many which are not. How do I know? Paul now takes his attention and after the praise that ended chapter 3 is ready to show us some of the direction of how to find the right path that we can follow. So let me read with you verses 1 through 10 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Here's what he says. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life, also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Hey, Timothy, you're facing incredible pressures. There are voices out there that are calling the people in your churches and they're being distracted. In fact, as we go back to verse 1, the Spirit expressly says, in later times, some will depart from the faith. You know, you probably see it yourself. Maybe you became a Christian a long time ago. Maybe you've only been a Christian a short time. But maybe you know some Christians that you say, you know, they were so alive and they were so vibrant in their faith and I wanted to be like them and I modeled myself after them and then something happened. I don't know what it was. Maybe you accepted Christ or trusted Christ when you were a small child and you were in church and, and you prayed and you really had a heart and passion for God and then you got into the high school years and very few of your friends believed like you did and they said, why do you believe that stuff? And all of a sudden you said, you know, why do I believe this stuff? Or maybe you were old enough to go to the university and all of your professors don't believe in God and they say, and your professors, if they ever knew you were a Christian, you know they would make fun of you. And all of your peers are saying to you, you know, yeah, that's great for you, but boy, I can't believe anybody would buy into that stuff. And it begins to plant doubt in your mind. 
or maybe you're an adult and, and you found a job and you've gotten married and you're starting to raise children and all of a sudden you're so busy and you're so active and you have so many things going on you say, I used to love the Lord with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. What happened? These people were not only being distracted, he said, they were leaving the faith, they were departing from the faith, and they actually devoted themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. If you remember me telling you a, a number of sessions ago, I had a very sensitive conscience when I was a little boy. I, I still to this, this day, if, if I do something wrong, it just bothers me so very much. But what he's saying is people, even though they may have had a, a sensitive conscience, things happen and if you've ever seared something, maybe you fried a piece of meat and it browns on one side, it deadens it. And he says these people have lied so much that when they lie, it doesn't even bother them anymore. They can tell a lie with a straight face and act like it's the truth and yet it's a lie. He said there are going to be people in these churches, Timothy, I know that there are, who started out as a dynamic Christian people and loved Jesus Christ and loved the church and they started listening to these teachers and their faith started to, to wilt and to die and to, to settle down and they started following other paths. And he says, Timothy, please, that can't, you can't allow that to happen. Verse 3, here's what some of them were being asked to do, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Hey, Timothy, God created the notion of marriage. It was good. He brought Adam and Eve together. He celebrates marriage. He uses that as, as I tell the couples that I marry. Marriage is the best human picture we have of a relationship with God that God gave us the concept of marriage. And he said, they're telling you that to be godly, you shouldn't get married. In fact, they're also telling you there's some foods that you had better not eat. And Paul says, Timothy, everything that God gives us is to be received with thanksgiving for those who believe and know the truth. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. Did, did you know that mealtime can be a worship service? That when you sit down and the food is placed on your table, and it doesn't matter how much or how little or high, how, uh, how high a quality or low a quality it is, that food is a gift of God. We tried this in our home a few times, and we don't do it very often. But I said, you know, we have a little prayer before we start our meal. And one time I prayed, and my children thought I was kind of silly. I said, Lord, thank you for the meat that is on this table. And, and the, maybe it was chicken. I don't remember what it was. Thank you for creating chickens that give us eggs and that give us meat. And Father, thank you for the glass of milk that we have to drink. And the cows, and your, your incredible idea of forming a cow and producing milk that becomes healthy for us. And Father, thank you for this lettuce salad and the green plants that grow and the nutrients that they have. I don't remember exactly what my prayer was, but it was kind of like that. And I, and my, and I, got, and I said, Amen. And, and my children said, What was that, Dad? <laughs> and I said, Well, if everything we have is a gift from God and He created it for us to use, I said, our mealtime is an opportunity for us to worship. I'm not saying you have to pray like that or if you have to have this long, elaborate prayer, especially if you have little children, they're going to say, Dad, don't pray so long. I'm hungry. I want to eat. But I think that sometimes we get too used to the notion that we are, we are owed everything, that everything is a right. I said, no, not everything is a right. What we have in food and in marriage and in relationship is a gift from God. And these people are steering them off the path. And he says, don't listen to that. Don't listen to that. There are voices that try to get us off the path. And there are voices that can steer us to Christ-likeness and to godliness in very incredible and healthy ways. And you can look at a whole variety of issues that your society is facing right now. 
well, you know, it, we have to be tolerant. It's a big movement in our country to be tolerant of all vantage points, of all religions, of all ideas. What's funny about that is the people in our country who are asking us to be tolerant are intolerant of Christianity. That finally the pressure is beginning to grow even in our country that says, you know what, we can tolerate this faith and that faith and that faith, but those Christians, they're just too narrow. Paul says, Timothy, you have to warn these people about the voices that are out there that are trying to steer them away from a relationship with Jesus Christ that is based on the Word of God and the character of God. For in verse 5 it says, To be received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the Word of God and prayer. Hey, Timothy, in your worship, your food, your marriage, your relationship, because everything is a gift from God. It is sanctified. It is made holy by the Word of God and prayer. Please, Timothy, don't listen to these voices. Don't let your people listen to these voices because it's going to steer them off the path that would lead them to Christ's likeness. And we're going to have to make choices, people. We really are. We're going to have to make choices in the music we listen to, in the activities that we participate in, in the things that we're teaching in our churches, in the things that we're teaching our children. We're going to have to make some choices. Or the enemy is going to continue to infiltrate and to penetrate. And his goal is to destroy the church one little nugget at a time. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.